Human rights and the rights of nature are interconnected and interdependent. We need a revolutionary shift in our relationships with each other, with our clothes, with fashion supply chains and with the natural world. We are bringing people together from across our community, amplifying unheard and marginalized voices and working together to explore innovative and interconnected solutions. On today's show, we engage in a comprehensive discussion about what ethical and sustainable fashion is, but most importantly, how this affects how we, as consumers, can help brands become more transparent. We're joined by three industry experts. Cyril Nyker, who is the CEO of Imprint Luxury and Country Coordinator for Fashion Revolution South Africa. Uh, Cyril is a sought-after fashion consultant, mentor, and influencer in the South African fashion space. Esetu Trenga, who is the CEO and co-founder of Rewoven, who made it to the top 10 finalists for the H&M Foundation Global Change Award in 2018. And last but certainly not least, Sally Ann Kasner, who is the director at Circular Vision. Sally's background in waste minimization and many years in the resource efficiency and cleaner production consulting environment has provided a sound base from which she works. To our panelists, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, for us. Now, firstly, people often confuse sustainable with ethical fashion. Let's start with the definition. Cyril, what is ethical fashion? Well, Colin, I mean, I could give you a textbook um, explanation, but I think really, you know, just to keep it very simple, it's really just doing the right thing in for people, for planet, the environment. Well, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. no, literally, that's what it is. I think, you know, when we enter this conversation on sustainability, and then we have these different terminologies. I don't know how helpful it is in us actually understanding what sustainability is. Mm -hmm. Of course, in the academic literature, um, sustainable fashion is probably a focus on eco environmental sustainability. So internalizing the environmental costs that um, were involved in making your product. Whereas ethical, according to a textbook definition, ethical um, fashion would be internalizing both the social costs and the environmental costs. Yeah. I'm not sure how helpful both of those definitions are, um, but like as Cyril is saying, it's really about how did you make this product um, and did you care about the people who made this product? Um, did you care about the environment in making this product? And also, how are you treating the people that you're selling the product to? Um, are they included? Um, who are you including um, as part of the customer base? And just generally, as Cyril said, doing the right thing, yeah. good business. Well, Sally, and let's zoom in on South Africa. When, when thinking sustainable fashion, is it more important to focus on the human aspect or the human element, or is product sustainability uh, what, we, what we consider more important? It's a really difficult question. Got so many social elements um, at play. And essentially, it's, uh, it's a case of, I think, we need to maybe look at the whole system. Often, we don't look at the system when we're looking at uh, sustainability and sustainability is an integrated process it's yeah. not just about the environment it's about social and economy as well yeah yeah, yeah. you mentioned process and let's talk about that a bit more uh, is sustainability a process of simply copying and pasting international standards or practices or are we localizing uh, our practices here in South Africa I definitely think we need to localize um, I mean, obviously we can learn from what's happening internationally and take and learn from from perhaps uh, successes and failures but mm -hmm. I think we have an African context, mm -hmm. which is so rich. I think we really need to harness what's happening here. Yeah. And I think um, a lot of the times when it comes to the conversation sustainability, especially in the African context, we forget that we actually have been sustainable for a long time. Um, a lot of the times poor countries or developing countries or like Africa, we know the values of not generating a lot of waste and how to use your waste. We know values of how to repair your things and how to make them last longer. Um, the, we know how to live in community with people. Yeah. Ubuntu is a huge part of our culture, South Africans and Africans. And we've always understood that being together, sharing resources is something that is important. We might not have called it sustainability. It might, it, you know, it might not have stuck to us in that way but we are in a lot of ways quite sustainable and so that when it comes to us trying to advance the work of sustainability I think we can work both ways yeah. where we have a lot to teach to international mm. community about how to be sustainable but at the same time we also need innovation and technology and certain practices that they know a lot about mm. that we can also learn to advance sustainability. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. I just want to pick up on what Asetu is saying and Sally in the sense that um, Yes, there are brands internationally that are doing it correctly, 
but also we have been doing this for a long time, as Asetu was saying, but also there's been a lot of cultural appropriation mm -hmm. from designers mm -hmm. from Africa. Mm -hmm. And I think that is something that we need to now be sort of taking very consciously in, in terms of how do we actually control that? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, due diligence has to be done by designers from the West. Um, and it's not just about crediting the source, because mm. it's also about are you actually, um, apart from crediting the source, are you actually contributing to the community that you're actually copying the yeah, design absolutely. from? Many South African designers still don't believe that they are sustainable. <laughs> uh, you could touch on this, I say, to yes. what are some of the best practices or some of the practices that a designer uh, should adopt or would need to do uh, to get to this point? Well, firstly, I actually think that a lot of our designers have been a lot, a lot more sustainable than they think they are okay. compared to the bigger brands. Mm -hmm. I think if you're comparing smaller brands, um, a lot of them have more smaller supply chains and in terms of you know, the impact on carbon emissions and stuff like that, they tend to have to be a lot more low impact. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very possible for small businesses to be sustainable and I think a lot of the times they kind of have that upper end. Um, but if you're looking at designers, what to do as a designer, what to think about, yeah. It's a number of things. First, I think obviously sustainable material sourcing. Um, what what materials are you using? Recyclable materials or biodegradable materials? Um, are you thinking about designing for circularity or recyclability at the beginning yeah, by choosing yeah. the right materials? Um, I also think you need to think about waste or how much waste are you generating as you're making your garments? Um, um, are you doing something with that waste that is productive or are you taking it to landfill or are you finding interesting ways to reuse that waste mm. um, and, and, and not contribute to further pollution? Um, then I think the nice thing about designers that I like is that they communicate directly with the consumer. So are you teaching the consumer mm -hmm. how they can actually make this garment last longer? Are you offering them services where they can come back and repair the garment if something has gone wrong? Do they know that they can get it recycled at the end of the life cycle? Um, so th there's, a, there's a lot of things to think Absolutely. about and, and I think Absolutely. you guys could share some, but um, it, it's, 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 yeah. yeah, I think it's about are you from the beginning when you start making your garment, are you already thinking about mm. how long this garment is going to live and its impact? We've also got to realise that in South Africa we have issues with uh, import duties and fabrics which, are, which affects our local designers. We've also got import duties on fibre which is another issue. So I think it's a real thing that affects designers in terms of sustainability. And then let's really bring it local in terms of localizing it in South Africa. We have electricity issues. We have water shortages. And this really affects the productivity of designers. So I think we've got to look at it holistically. You know, we can't just kind of segment it and kind of figure out, is the designer being sustainable or aren't they? But I'm sure Sally can also sort of add I'd love to jump in there because I think we also have the uh, the import of second-hand clothing, yeah. which I think both of you could speak to as well. Yeah. So that's coming into the market. And um, just the increase of fast fashion, the availability of cheaper clothing um, is just really increasing the amount of clothing, good quality clothing that is ending up on, in our landfills. Uh, we are noticing that the trend is increasing, that uh, normally we would find you know, lower quality, well-worn clothes in landfill. Now we're finding good quality clothes in landfill and generally coming from more of our informal areas, Absolutely. which is which is really a, a big question in my mind. Uh, Nasrul, I know that you head up one of the most talked about fashion movements here in South Africa, fashion revolution. But what exactly is the fashion revolution and, and how did this all come about? Okay, I, I'm not sure we're the most talked about because uh, <laughs> there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, great people doing phenomenal things. Yeah. But, but thank you for that. Um, Fashion Revolution really is around the 2013 anniversary of the Rana Plaza collapse in Dakar, Bangladesh. And, and really every year it's a memorial to those lives that were lost. So we actually take a stance globally. We're in over 92 countries, which is the Fashion Revolution movement. And I'm not sure if you know this, but the Rana Plaza collapse was the fourth largest industrial disaster mm -hmm. in history. And, and that's really, you know, if you sit back and really think about that, that's basically on the clothes that we wear. Yeah. Mm. Um, and stuff like that should not happen, mm -hmm. not in today's society. So Fashion Revolution really is a movement which comes about every year on the anniversary to remind people that who made your clothes? We need to know better, we need to do better, um, and really what are we actually doing? So it's not just uh, a cute hashtag. Mm. It actually has a conscious um, movement behind it.
With that sense role, I think it almost forces us into a position where across the board we've got to be transparent. Mm. Now, I know that many international retailers have adopted the transparency index, but are South African retailers following suit? We've reached out to um, all of the retailers in South Africa. We've had a favorable, favorable response from some, yeah. um, and we were declined by others. And that really causes a cause for concern. Mm -hmm. So I do think that the transparency index is important. Yeah. Um, and by the retailers that have sort of declined, um, you know, we're going to keep trying. Uh, because we're really not here to name and shame. Mm -hmm. We're really here to come around and kind of say, listen, we need to do better. Mm -hmm. And we can do better. That's the point. I think in order to do better, we've got to talk about the issues that we often do not want to talk about. And, and if I can pose this question to you, I'd say to, let's zoom in on the human element. And that really is where the ethics or the discussion around ethics within fashion uh, begins. The importance of human rights and inclusion. Let's zoom in on that for a second. Yeah. Um, I think when we look at business and when we're trying to create any product, people are a huge part of that. Yeah. You, you wouldn't have created your product if people didn't put in their time to do it, and you wouldn't have a market if people weren't buying into this. So people are a huge element of business. Um, when we're looking at like the supplier side, um, there's a lot of issues there to think about. Um, and I often think about the sustainable development goals that kind of help me there, poverty. Um, how is you making this product um, either advancing, uh, keeping someone in, in a state of poverty or alleviating mm -hmm. them out of poverty, they were going into conversations about wages, are you giving people a, you know, a living wage, not yeah. just a minimum wage, but a living wage. Mm -hmm. um, then we also talk about um, skills development and, and um, further prospects of employability. Are you really investing in your people so that they can, you know, become, you know, con continue to develop themselves, but also continue to develop your company as well? Are there prospects for them to be promoted in the company? Are you just, if I'm a sorter, I work in a recycling space, if I'm a sorter, am I going to be a sorter for 10 years? Or is this company actually wanting me to develop um, and to grow as a person? Um, and then we talk about gender equality, which is a huge thing, I think, in the context of the clothing industry, which is, 75% I think or probably even more yeah, dominated yeah. by women. Um, how is you making this product contributing to that um, women empowerment um, generally in the country? Um, so there's lots to think about um, when, when it comes to the human element. Then we come on the demand side, which I think we often forget about because when we talk about sustainable fashion, I think we we'll always focus on the workers' rights um, and which is the most important thing. Um, but then we also talk about representation. Um, who are you selling these garments to? Um, uh, and how are you selling those garments? Are you making garments for small, medium, or large? Or are you making garments for everyone? Um, can differently able people wear these garments? So that also also speaks about inclusion, representation, diversity. Um, and it's very important, again, because this is your customer base. These are the people that are buying into your vision um, to make it move forward. So you have to think about that. And without them, you're not going to have economic sustainability in the first place. So to ensure your economic sustainability of your business, you need to have some sort of focus on social sustainability or the human element. Mm -hmm. Contribution, I think one of the important factors of this discussion, um, I think, we're all interlinked. Various stakeholders have different roles to play, but often we too, we don't want to talk about roles and responsibilities. Let's do that on the show this afternoon. The various stakeholders in the industry, I mean, we've got unions that are, that are regulating uh, quite a bit of the movement in the industry, but what are their different roles and responsibilities? Hmm. That's, a, that's again, another quite a difficult question yeah. because like you said, nobody really wants to talk about it. So I think for roles and responsibility, I mean, the brand owners, they have a very, very powerful voice yeah. and should be uh, being transparent about what they're putting out into the marketplace and the impact that they're having. On a positive side, in yeah. South Africa, we yeah. have a very active union okay. and we also have the bargaining council, which yeah. ensures minimum fair wage. Um, these are important um, governance bodies to have. Yes. However, we can do better. Yeah. Mm. What can we do better? We've got to look at our, our history in South Africa. And if you look at um, most of the people working in factories, how do they get to work? Mm -hmm. How do they travel to work? Um, and they live far out from where the factories are situated. Um, you know, so I think the union can do a lot better in terms of uh, taking care of people. And I think also the owners of the factories need to step up as well in terms of uh, operating times, in terms of what they're doing for their staff, um, you know, in terms of um, just basic needs. And I think, you know, I want to jump into a conversation that Sally and I had some time back. Um, something as sanitary pads for women. 
Um, we, if you talk about waste, if you talk about uh, the system and systemic change, um, the women in the factories cannot afford something as basic as sanitary pads. Mm -hmm. So the owners need to step up and why not have a vending machine offering the woman this for free? Absolutely. You know, your productivity would go up, mm. uh, the woman's dignity is restored, uh, and also they won't be using scraps of fabric. I was horrified when I heard that story. You know, and so, you know, what can we do? This is what we can do. I think as consumers, and that's the thing about being a conscious consumer, as consumers, we should no longer not be interested how the product is made. We should start asking questions, and we should demand for trans um, transparency and traceability. And I think in that, having the consumer being part of the question as well mm -hmm. and wanting to know how the product is made um, and so that they consume it better is a very huge role that consumers can play. We often don't speak directly to the consumer. Uh, Sally, what should consumers be looking out for when shopping in the sustainability aisle? We don't ask that question. I mean, do I check who makes my clothes, for example? So what should consumers be looking out for when they go and shop in that little aisle? So, so Colin, firstly, hopefully <laughs> there won't be a sustainability aisle. Hopefully when we go into a shop in the future, hopefully near future, everything in that shop will be um, sustainably sourced and ethically produced. I think that is really the goal that we should all be striving th um, for. Um, so that, you know, as a consumer, I can feel comfortable knowing that the, the clothes that I'm buying actually have been uh, manufactured correctly. But then to read a label and actually believe what it says. So if somebody says that this is ethically sourced um, material, can they actually have some sort of um, faith that that statement is actually true? Mm -hmm. So for, from a consumer's point of view, um, I really do feel that we need to ask more questions. And we mustn't just accept the first answer that comes, or just accept the marketing that, that message that, that comes from it. So we need to be responsible um, and uh, you know, ask the question and not accept the first answer. Now, according to WWD, consumers spent more than 7 billion hours online searching for sustainable, ethical, fair trade and eco-friendly items in 2020. Moreover, fast fashion had a particularly difficult year. Now, could this be indicating a shift and decline in the fast fashion industry? So many brands claim to be sustainable, but are they really? <laughs> Well, look, I think um, the pandemic has really given us a pause moment yeah. and it's given us, uh, you know, to sort of take stock and to shift our business model to pivot if we were not doing things correctly. And that's why, you know, the stats that you've just read, um, millennials, for instance, mm. you know, 10% um, of millennials will shop even if it's a higher price, if they know the value chain. Mm -hmm. So to come back in terms of sustainability and ethical fashion, uh, it really comes full circle in terms of where do you start and you start from an education point of view. So at the campus that teaches fashion students, do we actually teach the students about ethical fashion and sustainable business practices? That's a question we need to ask. Mm -hmm. But more than ask the question, what do we need to do about that? And also as a consumer, and I put myself in that position, I need to be informed correctly. Brands need to inform me in terms of where the garments are coming from who made the garments and how they were made. Um, these are important things. So, you know, it's, it's a lack of information that it's not that it's not there, it is how is that information channeled and how do we get it out? I think a lot of brands are trying to be sustainable now. Um, they have to be sustainable now. There's a lot more consumer pressure. Um, but because of everything that you mentioned, the lack of information, the lack of education, a lot of them may have fallen into the trap of just using the sustainability or throwing in the word ethical there in your marketing to get people um, to get buying into your product. Um, and obviously if you're just using the word ethical and you're not actually being sustainable, then you, you're not you know, doing what you're meant to be doing, you're greenwashing. Because if you look at a lot of retailers, um, their sustainability department is under the marketing department. So that says a lot already about what they think sustainability is. But I know quite a few retailers have actually started to move the sustainability department from being under marketing to under business optimization, mm -hmm. which is now showing um, that sustainability is becoming more in integrated into what the business is. I think there's been a lot more call for how do we produce more locally mm -hmm. and um, source more locally, which I think is, is really a, a great opportunity yeah, for South yeah. Africa. I like that you mentioned, let's say, that we are in the TV uh, stage of having these discussions of public or on public platforms or forums like this. When you take ethical fashion versus sustainable fashion, and at this point it's versus, we're comparing mm. the one you know, to the mm. other. But when we take those two uh, uh, discussions, 
at what point should we really be starting with the education, educating the mm -hmm. consumers and the mm -hmm. fashion students and all these different stakeholders? Where do we start having this conversation? So, Colin, you've got to start from the beginning. I mean, can you imagine going into a retail store, picking up a garment and looking at the care label of a swing ticket? And on the garment, it says that this garment was made using child labor or this garment was used, made using uh, human trafficking. Would you buy that garment? You wouldn't. You know, and that's the fundamental issue here. And it is imperative that designers, manufacturers, governance bodies take this into consideration. And it is th it's those simple questions. How do we ask them? And for sure, I understand on a marketing level, you cannot be as direct as that. But you can surely phrase the question in a way that can be powerful for a brand and educate the consumer at the same time. So ethical versus sustainability for me is a, is a little bit of enigma. Um, I think we really need to start looking at things from a much more systematic, circular, circular perspective yeah. and actually integrating these terminologies because they sometimes just cause confusion. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think the fundamental, because we get lost in terminologies like you're saying, mm -hmm. and terminologies alienate people and do I know, do I not know um, what the latest terminology is. The point I think with um, Ethical, sustainable, ethical or sustainable fashion is that are these clothes made the right way? I think that is the fundamental Absolutely. core of it. Um, how were they made and can I be proud to and, and, and be sure that I'm supporting something that was done in the right way? And then in closing, where to from here and, and uh, what is the next move, Mr. Naika? April is Fashion Revolution Month, so I would ask that people hop online, um, get informed, and sign the manifesto and find out what we're all about. Today proves that it's the role of the retailer, the consumer, the fashion designer, as well as the unions in this country. And collectively, we're all responsible for moving the global fashion economy forward. To my panel, thank you so much. Sarul Naika, Esetu Penga, and Sally Ann Kazma. We're taking to the streets to find out what local consumers have to say, and most importantly, if they know who makes their clothes.